And so Paul's saying, well, if you continue in, in these things like faith and hope and patience and all these things, godliness, then you won't die when you have children. Uh, which also seems like a promise that's really hard to keep, right? Like, what if you do, you know? Does that mean that you weren't godly? And so those are kind of the two possible interpretations and most theologians. I mean, it's not, it's not like there's a lot of diversity on this. Most theologians would say it must be the position that we taught, that it's referring to Jesus. Welcome to Whitefields Community Church Sermon Extra. This is our weekly video in which we go a little bit deeper on the topic which was covered in Sunday's sermon. Uh, today, instead of Pastor Jason or Pastor Mike, I'm joined by my dear wife, Rosemary Katie. Hey, Rosemary, thanks for Hi. joining for this. Now, why is Rosemary here? Well, the reason is because this past Sunday, as we've been studying through the book of 1 Timothy, we came to a passage which deals with the roles of men and women in the church. And some of these uh, parameters, if you will, that are laid out there, it could be a little bit controversial. And, uh, and since they pertain to women, we thought, you know, it'd probably be a good idea to discuss it further with a woman. So yeah, rather than men telling women. Yeah. And I mean, not that that's always that wrong, right? I mean, it's no. just to say that, hey, this is a woman's perspective on this topic. Right. And so um, our sermon from Sunday, if you haven't yet listened to it, really encourage you to do so. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on our podcast or on the podcast, any podcast app, uh, the Whitefields Community Church Podcast. We post all of our sermons and these sermon extras up there. Make sure to go and get that uh, podcast in your feed if you don't have it yet. And you can also now watch these videos and listen to the audios on our Whitefields Church app, which is just everything. It's a dedicated app uh, where you can do lots of things. One of the things you can do is listen to these messages, watch these videos, and uh, share them with others. So if you haven't yet done that, encourage you to do so. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, make sure to like, subscribe. If you're, watching, if you're listening on podcast, love it if you'd subscribe and share it with others. Maybe give us a review. That helps boost us in algorithms. So again, we're sitting through the book of 1 Timothy. You know, one of the things that often happens is that I've known people who have avoided teaching the book of 1 Timothy, and they say, well, it has a lot of really good content, but this section but, is yeah. so hard either for some people to receive or it's hard to interpret because some of the verses aren't just like hard to understand. They're actually, I'm sorry, they're not just hard to accept. They're hard to understand, like mm -hmm. what is actually being said here. So we're going to talk about some of that. Um, but yeah, so 1 Timothy 2, verses 8 through 15. And the view that uh, we showed from the scriptures is what's often called a complementarian view, mm -hmm. which I think is a nice word, right? Because it means that men and women, very much like in the Trinity, how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal yet have complementary roles, that men and women in the church are equal, and yet have complementary roles, which also means the different roles. Um, so, Rosemary, what has been your experience of that in our church and other churches in general? Um, well, here I lead the women's ministry. So um, I'm teaching regularly, and there are other women regularly teaching also, but we're teaching other women and um, here at church, I'm also helping with the Next Gen ministry, and there are quite a few women in there also teaching in that context. Yeah, and so to be clear, the, what you might be making reference to is 1 Timothy 2, verse 12 says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man, but she's to uh, learn quietly with all submissiveness. Yeah, but I have a lot of history just being around for a while. Um, I was a missionary for a long time, and what was interesting is that I'd come home for a furlough, and I did a lot of traveling, and I would just have different experiences at different churches. Sometimes I'd say, hey, I'm in town. Um, is it okay to share at your church? And you know, beforehand we'd set this all up. And um, there were churches that were fine with me sharing on Sundays in the pulpit. 
and then there were um, more rare, but there were churches that asked me to speak on a midweek service. They would ask, oh, are you in town instead? You know, could you stay like an extra day or two and stay for our midweek? We'd really like you to speak, but we don't do that on Sundays. Could you do the midweek? And so I realized that there were a um, couple churches that would have preferred that rather than have, and I, and I don't know if it was necessarily me being in their pulpit on a Sunday but I was sharing about my just ministry, what I was doing, and I wasn't uh, giving Bible verses or teaching, but I think that was maybe part of it. Oh yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I've heard somebody put it this way. They said, if you, um, you know, anytime you speak about ministry, like good luck giving a testimony about your life, good luck speaking about ministry and not saying things of a theological nature. Right. Right. So you're saying things about God. You're perhaps referencing the scriptures, whether you read them directly, which yeah. you may. Use, or, I would use scripture to kind of yeah. share the heart of what I was doing, um, whether it was refugee work or, you know, orphans and things like that. I was definitely sharing scripture, but not teaching a passage or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and I think that what this comes down to is kind of this discussion about the fact that there's this principle that we read there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and yet the application of that principle um, is going to vary a little bit by nature, right? Like right. What, where do you draw the line? Some people are going to draw a line at a different place than others amongst those who still hold this principle. And, I mean, I think you can see that um, – on lots of levels, like, you yeah. know, the question, like, where, where does this apply? Like, at what point can a woman teach children's ministry? Can a woman teach, okay, can she teach middle schoolers? Can she teach high schoolers? Like, can up she to teach what age is this appropriate? Right, right, because uh, it's not <clears throat> clearly defined in the Bible at what point a boy transitions into being <laughs> right. a man. Now, the Jewish culture, for example, has something like bar mitzvah and things like that when in the community's eyes, but remember that bar mitzvah stuff, that's not in the Bible, right? It's not like an actual like biblical guideline. And so it is a little bit of one of these things where we have a principle, but the application of it is different. Is, is there's, there can be some diversity right. amongst those who hold it. Yeah. So, um, I did have an experience where they said, well, um, actually, you know, I guess maybe after talking with the elders or whatever was happening at their church, they asked if I would share after the service in a, uh, like what we have is the foyer. They said, would you just um, instead come to the foyer and just plan on sharing right away after church lets out? And so they moved me from sharing during the service to being right after service. And yeah. I, I didn't mind that. I mean, really, it was okay. I understood. I didn't make contention over that, but I understood the point of that. And um, they maybe even had time limit on you know, multiple services, moving yeah. people in and out, whatever. And so I've had that experience where they said, um, let's do it right after service. So you're not in the pulpit maybe, but, um, I have a lot of other experiences. One, one of the big ones that I have shared before was that, you know, I was just a young missionary. I remember struggling with some, just some theology in the Bible and just working things out what I was reading. And, um, I, was visiting some pastors, just, you know, I go on furlough or I'm traveling. And I just remember having this conversation where I asked someone to just talk to me a bit, help me work some things out, add some questions and uh, started sharing my questions. And what really floored me was this pastor's response to say, hey, is this a conversation we really need to have? Um, how is this going to help you as a missionary. You're a woman on the mission field and you're, you know, just assuming you're serving orphans, widows. And why is this applicable to, to you? And I was really shocked because I thought, you know, the Bible's there for everyone to read and it's a great thing to be chewing on and growing in my faith. And why is he challenging my desire to learn and grow and understand some challenging things in the Bible? Yeah, because widows couldn't possibly need to know answers to theological uh, questions, it, right? It like or orphans. Me, orphans don't I, need theology. I didn't even know what to say. I thought, what? <laughs> uh, okay. Like this guy's going there and it's, it's kind of insulting, isn't it? 
I was insulted and I was thinking, am I supposed to be insulted? I mean, what is going on here? I've not been talked to like that. And he just kind of shut me down and I thought, well, I'll just on my own work through this. If it's not worthy for some pastor to talk to a woman about some theology that I, it was really strange yeah, to me. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. You know, um, so just a related topic that I think ties into what you're saying is that, you know, you and I, uh, along with some friends and colleagues, we are part of leading uh, an initiative called the Expositors Collective. And Expositors yeah. Collective is about teaching people how to rightly divide the word of God, how to present it well, how to do it accurately. And, um, and these events are open to both men and women. And the yeah. reason I always tell people is I said, look, uh, you have women in your church who are teaching. In fact, it's told to us in the Bible like in Titus, that women, the older women are to teach the younger women. Like this is like a biblical imperative. It's a command. Furthermore, they're teaching others. If nothing else, right, shouldn't they also know how to divide the word for themselves? Right. right. And I mean, um, so I just want to go on record and say that we believe that theology is for everybody. Right. And that we want anybody who handles the word of God, whether it's reading it in their personal study or proclaiming it publicly to any group of people, whether that's a group of children or women or adults or mixed group or whatever it is, we want them to be able to do that well and right. accurately and uh, to be equipped. And so, you know, that brings up another topic that I was, I was thinking about in this regard. Some people would say, well, does this mean that women don't have the same spiritual gifts? Like do women, like for example, we read in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 about different spiritual gifts. They include the gifts of teaching and the gifts of leadership. Mm -hmm. So does this mean that women don't have those gifts? Or if they do have those gifts, it's just like, wow, I guess you drew the short straw <laughs> and now you don't get to use the gifts you were given have fun this life and see in heaven. I, I mean, I was just sharing that I, I have an opportunity to be in two ministries here where I am leading, leading a class of kids and leading a group of women. And so we do study the Bible. I am, you know, putting together a little teaching, a little sermonette for kids or, you know, a, a long one for women. Um, reading commentary, just going through the passage, looking up words in Greek, I mean, it's happening for women and it's, it's a good thing, I think, for us to grow in our faith through the word of God. And, you know, just even taking it further at home, I read the Bible to the kids. We have a 15 year old boy, a son. And, you know, at what point is it not okay for me to be teaching through the Bible to my son? But I, I just see that as something I'm, I'm doing and something important. And, uh, and using the gift of teaching, you can use that in so many places. It doesn't have to be, you know, in a setting like one of these three that I'm talking about. There's a variety, right? And, and let me add to that and say this. Not every person who has the gift of teaching is going to be called to what we might call pulpit ministry, platform oh, yeah. ministry, or to be a lead pastor in any way. Like, you know, I remember... Um, dealing with this before I was a pastor as a missionary and realizing that there were so many opportunities for me to teach, whether it was right. to teach my peers who were young adults or youth at the time, whether it was, you know, in one-on-one -on -one settings, home settings, whatever that was. Like if you have a gift of teaching, you will teach when you're given the opportunity. Right. Having a gift of teaching and leadership doesn't mean that you automatically deserve or like are, you know, you, you're going to have a position, a particular office or position in the church functionally, right? right. Like lots of people I don't have think, that gift. Yeah. I don't think these are gifts that you necessarily show up at a church doorstep <laughs> and say, hello, church, I've got these gifts. Let me in and let me <laughs> use them. Yeah. That's not the way it's going to work. Yeah. I And I have had that happen. I know. Before. <laughs> and I think they need to be told and that. And not just with the teaching gift, with lots of other gifts. Like, oh, yeah. you know, anyway, so I think that's, that's an interesting take. Okay. So how far does this principle apply? That's another interesting question. Like what about women as president? What about women as CEOs, professors, uh, et cetera? How far do we take this? I think those are positions women can definitely hold, right? I mean, I don't think that uh, this moves outside of what this passage is describing because it's verse 15 that um, Paul is writing to Timothy that this is how I want you to conduct yourselves in the household of God. And so this is the context that we're talking about here. It's not like in a business or in a school. That's different. 
Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I always want to specify that, that in verses 8 through 15 of 1 Timothy 2, he's talking about conduct of men and women in the church. He's not just talking about in society in general, right? right? And so uh, in no way would we ever want people to think that what this means is that we don't believe that women are able to serve or that they're able to do these things in these other areas of life and society. That's why on Sunday I was so careful to point out that the church is a alternative community which functions by different rules and guidelines than just society at large. And so I would say the church and in the home are the two places the Bible does describe this kind of male leadership. And yes. that's really it. You know, it's it, it doesn't mean in, in society in general, this is how it is. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the problem with that is um, that some women get offended by this passage because they think that, you know, that they're not allowed to lead, period, anywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. And there is a place in the church for women to lead and serve and teach. But, um, you know, that's to be probably just like I was explaining in my experience, just different from church to church and how they would want that expressed in their church. But also on top of that, I think women should just be encouraged that they're um, out in society. You know, there's no boundary. Like they can be a CEO. They can be the school principal. They can lead in these contexts. Mm -hmm. And do a good job. Yeah, of course. And, you know, that's another reason why one of the things we pointed out on Sunday was that when it talks about submission and things like that, first of all, some people think that submission is a bad word because submission implies a, maybe a, a lesser degree of value, worth, or capability, right. competence. Right. Another pushback against this is the idea that they say, oh, well, so you're just saying that all women have to just shut their mouths and and do what men tell them to do. And that's actually yeah. not what we're saying at all. In fact, we would be very careful to say that we don't even believe that that applies in the church in this sense, right? The submission is to, is number one, a general demeanor of the heart, a receptiveness, right. as opposed to contention. The other point is that this is submission to a married woman's own husband is what it says in Titus 2 verse 4, where it's a kind of the partner verse in Titus. And, and that's important because it's not just that uh, the men in the church have some kind of authority over all the women in the church. There's right. not a general That'd be authority. Weird. Yeah. And you know what? Some people, you know, you, sometimes people latch onto these things because of their, yeah, I would say it's weird and I'd say it's unhealthy. Right. And they'll latch yeah. onto it and say, well, look, now I'm the boss or something. And, um, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. So Yeah, there's, oh, I was just going to say, I mean, we, we uphold what um, is a balance in all of scripture, Galatians 3.28. We quote it all the time that, they're, that we're all equal in God's eyes, men, women, slave or free. You know, it just, it goes on to list everybody. Yeah. And just that's so important to point out that this is not like a lesser than, but that this is an organization mm -hmm. that God wants in his household. Yeah. And, and I think that is just something uh, that we need to say that this is the way God likes order. God is a God of order, as we know in first Corinthians. And that I think it's a wise thing that he's making an organization and kind of laying out what, what is important in the house of God. Yeah, you know, so I mentioned on Sunday, like the idea that submission is a bad word. If you believe that submission is a bad word or that it makes you less than the person to whom you submit in an orderly fashion, then you have a real problem because then you have to deal with Jesus, right? <laughs> yeah. So like the Bible says that Jesus submitted to the Father, even though he was equal to the Father. That's Philippians chapter two, that he was equal to the Father, yet he submitted to the Father's leadership during his time on earth, but also even in coming to the earth, says the father sent the son, right? The son sends the spirit, the spirit then glorifies the son and the father exalts the son. And so they see that there's submission, there's order, there's function without competition, without, um, you know, anyone feeling that they're less than or even being less than. And it's interesting because in theological terms, this is the kind of stuff I never talk about on Sunday because it's kind of just nerdy stuff, but it actually, it's, it really, it's really important. This yeah. is when we talk about the Trinity, there's two ways to talk about the Trinity theologically. One is called the ontological Trinity and the other one is called the economic Trinity. And I actually think that this is a really important parallel for then how we think about men and women in the church. Ontological refers to having to do with being, right? And so the ontological trinity is this. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. Like who are they in their being or who is God in his being? And then the economic trinity has to do with the 
roles and functions of the different persons in the Godhead. Right. And so if you look at the economic Trinity, you can see there are certain things that the father takes the lead in doing, or there are certain things that one member of the Trinity uniquely does. Right. And so Jesus, obviously his work involved with uh, redemption, salvation, and then furthermore intercession, the Holy Spirit, his primary function in the economic sense of the Trinity is um, having to do with sanctification, sealing, guiding, leading, reminding. So it's really interesting, you know, the, this idea of that even in theological terms, when we talk about God, we talk about it in two senses ontological and economic. And I think you can do the same thing with humanity, right? There's the ontological, are men and women equal? Absolutely. Okay. Economic, meaning the function, are they different? I think that that's also clearly yes in the Bible. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And so just this passage is, um, the way God's describing how he wants things done in the household of God and his household. And so I just, I was remembering back to when we started the church in Eger and, you know, just remembering that Paul's writing this to people in Ephesus. Right. And, um, I think it's good that they need some instruction. These are probably unchurched people, unruly coming in, like what's going on over here. Yeah. And I remember when we started the church in Eger, like we thought, Oh my, they were so funny because they would, just in the middle of your teaching, they would just start talking and having full voice conversations across Answer the room. Answer their phone. Yeah. I had people smoke cigarettes. Uh, in We were actually in a church building. <laughs> like it oh, wasn't like... Point. We were even outside at a table at one point. I mean, we were yeah. in so many spots. I remember uh, I had uh, a woman who used to come in every Sunday, sit in the back next to this window, the window and, smoke. and smoke during yeah. the entire sermon. And she was not, she was like, brand new, like never been to church in her life, right? She's just like, well, everywhere else I go, I sit I by guess, the window and smoke. I, yeah, I guess <laughs> there's no Bible verse on that, right? Well, I don't know. Yeah, like that's the a details, different topic. The details are different. But yeah, I know what but, you're saying. Like people who hadn't been to church, they didn't know what the etiquette was, I guess. Right. And, and they're showing up to church. And so Paul, I guess, saw fit at this point to write this letter and say, now people, this is what you really need to remember is important. Like women yeah. don't go there and your garb and your stuff and try and be impressive. That's not what this is about. Right. And women don't try and interrupt and, you know, answer your phone and stand up as the man is teaching the Bible, you know? So I just, I don't see the oddness when you really think about it as to what was happening back in that day yeah. that Paul would need to write this. Yeah. And I mean, we've had an experience with people doing all kinds of odd stuff and you were like, what? Yeah. I can imagine Paul having a problem with people answering their phones. That would that's annoying. So anyway, I'm just kidding. But, Smoking um, in the back. Yeah. Full voice conversation, okay, so, blowing the um, nose. Oh my god. Let's talk quickly about this. Like verse 15 of second of oh. first Timothy two. Yeah. Verse fifteen. Really difficult passage to interpret. I mentioned that on Sunday. Um, now someone asked that I kind of go through some of the possible interpretations of this passage. Oh yeah. There are three. I taught one of them. It's the one which, of course, I believe is correct. Otherwise, I wouldn't have taught it. Um, but also, I think, as you'll see with the other possible interpretations, there's really the best way to go. Okay, so the first one is um, the one that I gave, right? So it points out that in Greek, there's a um, definite article, the word the. So it's saved through the childbirth or the birth of the child, uh, referring to the birth of Jesus. It's a throwback to Genesis 3.15 and what Paul says in Galatians 4, that in the fullness of time, you know, God sent his son born of a woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay, that's the one. Again, I think that's the best. Here are the other two that we, I think we need to reject. One of them is um, that basically women were, part of bringing sin into the world. And therefore the way they will be saved is by having children. Um, that just seems like a very strange and contradictory thing for Paul to say compared to everything else he's already said. It's not like, well, that was just Paul's view. No, I don't think it was. I think that there's, you know, over time language things, people say things in language and language changes and we have to interpret it and say, okay, next uh, option the third option is to say that it's referring to women, you know, in that day, a lot of women died in childbirth. And so Paul's saying, well, if you continue in, in these things like faith and hope and patience and all these things, 
godliness, then you won't die when you have children. Uh, which also seems like a promise that's really hard to keep, right? Like, what if you do, you know? Does that mean that you weren't godly? And so those are kind of the two possible interpretations and most theologians. I mean, it's not, it's not like there's a lot of diversity on this. Most theologians would say it must be the position that we taught, that it's referring to Jesus. Um, but yeah, it's a famously difficult passage to understand well, I will give you one, one little nugget here, but it's not, I'm not sure that I agree with it, but it is, is one way of looking at it. Okay. This is kind of like off the cuff for what, for what it's worth. Take okay. this with a grain of salt. Okay. One other suggestion about how to read this passage, the word woman, gune in Greek and the word man, andros, like, like we use Android and stuff like that. Right. Um, these words can mean either woman and man or husband and wife, depending on the context. Now here, because of the context, it does seem that Paul's saying some consistent things about men in general and women in general. Yeah. However, um, if you were to read it this way, one suggestion is to say that what's being addressed here is women who were taking the role of domineering authority over their husband, kind of mm -hmm. like bossing their husbands around. And Paul's saying, I don't permit that. I don't permit a wife to boss around her husband. Again, the difficulty here, does it not go the other way? Like are husbands mm -hmm. allowed to boss their wives around and be mean to them? I, I don't believe so. So, okay, so that's one reason why we don't hold this view. But furthermore, he goes on to say, okay, maybe that's why that idea of women and or husbands and wives is tied to the idea of childbearing. Because as we're going to read later in Paul's letter to Timothy, there were some in the church who were actually teaching that it was not permitted. Uh, like if you're really godly, then you wouldn't have sex even if you were married. Wow. And you wouldn't uh, like basically, and this is, we know this from church history. This is a fact. People would get married and then live celibate lives as married people because they thought that that was more godly. Or they would say, if you're really godly, then you should never get married. And so they really upheld singleness, which is something really unique and interesting about Christianity, but to the detriment of the good design God has for marriage, children, and, and sex. And so all that to say, the, that view says, this is saying women, should, wives should not domineer over their husbands and withhold marital rights from them. Um, but rather should delight in having children. But again, the conclusion is still that's funky. That's a whole separate letter. Right, it's, a, it's a still a funky conclusion because you're coming yeah. down and saying, okay, yeah. so then you're going to be saved by having children? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think we still end up with the same problem, even if you follow that line of thinking. Yeah. It's an interesting passage because I actually was looking at, I think it's verse 14 where it says, Adam was... Um, Eve was deceived, not Adam, and became a transgressor. Yeah, That's what it says but, in verse 14. Yeah, yeah, but the interesting is it says Adam, and then it doesn't, says, doesn't say Eve. It says the woman yeah. was deceived and became a sinner. You know, That's just interesting how he names Adam but doesn't name Eve. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's, I think, why, too, a lot of people think that women are less than Mm. or perceived in the church as less than because they are so easily deceived. Ah, yeah. So the idea that perhaps a woman can't be the leader in the church because women in general are more easily deceived. I don't think that that's the point he's making, as I made clear on Sunday. Um, and I think that that can lead into some assumptions about people, some generalities that we are probably not helpful. Right. But I would say, how is that tied in? Some people say, well, what is his point? It says, well, Adam was created first. So what that tells us is that this design actually is not cultural. It's not something that changes over time. It's something tied to creation. Right. But the then beginning. why does he bring in the next part? I About think the it's, deception. I, here's yeah. how I taught it and how I understand it is that that is basically saying women played a role in sin coming into the world, but God has a unique dignity for them in that they got to play a role in him bringing salvation into the world. Cool. Hey, Rosemary, thanks so much for giving your perspective and your thoughts. Uh, everyone, thanks for tuning in. Tune in again next week. Remember, like, subscribe. 
on podcasts, on YouTube. And don't forget that Whitefields Church app. Make sure to visit our website, whitefieldschurch.com for everything Whitefields. God bless you guys.